well. So we have a little bit of a late start today. We were actually getting a proper lunch. I showed you a photo. I'm really proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> like a real lunch. Seems rare to have a real lunch. They actually, had grilled cheese too. Which oh wow! Pairs nicely That's with the tomato a soup. Nice combo, yeah. Yeah, we had we had been talking about doing something like this, and so we kind of got the ingredients. We have I, I told you those tomatoes that we love. Yeah. So we picked up our next cases of tomatoes, and then uh, we were also like, oh, we should use these tomatoes to make tomato soup, and then pair it with grilled cheese. So nice. That sounds really good. Yeah, it was yummy. And it's uh, real food, finally. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of <laughs> our other, our other stuff. So, um, so we've got some special visitors at uh, at one. So twenty minutes from now. Um, did you have you talked to? Do you know? Have you talked to Hadar about the setup here? Or what this is all about? No, but I looked at the email and was looking at um, Kai's. Dachshund, just to oh. see what he's up to. Oh, I don't recall. Did I see that? Maybe I saw it in mobile. Sometimes when I see things in mobile, I miss. Let's see. Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. And we probably don't want to. Well, we're not going to share the dachshund itself, but uh, it's worth taking a look through. It feels like there's a lot of people who are addressing talent in new ways. I think if you sort of look at the old style of talent, there's like, you know, LinkedIn or contingency recruiters are kind of the, you know, the traditional ways. And so there's a lot of people who are trying to unlock talent in new ways. So like other general categories, I'd say there's, there's like the, the Lambda schools of the world, you know, which is sort of like an onboard and education and connection. There's the triple bytes of the world that are like, you know, kind of in a sense platforms for brokering high quality intros with good filters on both sides, which we haven't really seen. How does triple byte work? I saw it in the uh, pitch deck, but I wasn't actually sure what that was. Yeah. So triple byte is, um, is a service that uh, it's basically like a democratizing access to high quality roles. And the way they do that is you take an online coding test and it you kind of like okay, continually okay. prove your skills. And then I think they do some, you know, phone screens and, you know, kind of externalized interviewers. And then they have quality relationships with, with companies where people would presumably be interested to find roles. So it's not like this open marketplace. Anybody can match with anybody. Kind of LinkedIn is sort of like, here's all the companies in the world. Here's all the people in the world. Good luck, right? <laughs> Triple Byte is like, here's, you know, here's the people who scored well that we're willing to make introductions for. And then here's the companies that we've curated that we think would be good career opportunities. So by curating both sides of the marketplace, you know, it's more attractive to companies to spend time there. It's more attractive to candidates to spend time there. Um, and the main thing is they're not shuffling the deck. They're not just saying, oh, let's get a Facebook engineer placed at Uber, you know, which I mean, there's some value to that. But I think they're really going for like, let's find the person who, you know, is like in the IT services department of, uh, you know, a CPG company or an insurance company, and they're kind of like not really achieving, you know, their full potential because they're kind of in a space that may be overlooked or misunderstood and their background yeah. might not seem obviously relevant to a Facebook or an Uber. And because Triple Byte can use their scoring and test, you know, kind of coding test system um, to, uh, you know, find people who are really high, high quality talent that can use the trust they have with those companies to make, high quality introductions. Okay. That's cool. And I think, you know, the things that I think we've even heard here before, like, you know, stuff around Renaissance Collective or around like Nathan, uh, some of his ideas are around sort of saying there's all these 
new aggregation points or hubs where people are gathering and there's like quality and filter and signal in those and sort of can you use some of those new signals that emerge in the world to help, you know, improve outcomes on, you know, both from candidate side and from company side. Yeah. So it's, like, it's almost like a major theme of the internet is we, we sort of said, let's democratize all the things and anybody can be a writer and all the content can live. And so in a sense, we're now at the stage where like, there's almost like too much we need to curate to help make better connections. And that's true in the content world. That's true in the talent world. That's true kind of everywhere. Like when we now, we now live in like these, you know, infinite content, infinite opportunities and connections. And so now like the curation layer, it becomes even you know much more needed and valuable. Yeah. I'm not sure. I, my understanding was that there's something in this new service, and I'm interested to hear from Kai, but that there's something around sort of how they can outsource the curation to make it like to make it. Hmm, what would you say? Maybe they're going to outsource the curation to make the like let the hubs where talent is aggregating do more of the taste making. Yeah. So kind of like, you know, everybody can roll their own. That's not, it's kind of a cheesy analogy, but maybe everybody can roll their own triple byte, even though it's not, it's not a good analogy because it's not really focused on technical talent and recruiting, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's kind of also like a lot of newsletters have their own job listings and stuff. So that's interesting to me. Mm -hmm. That it seems like he's basically like these people are doing it in a really disorganized way. Each newsletter just has a bunch of bullets at the end, like including like Packy's newsletter, or Lenny's newsletter, mm -hmm. it might be. So they could sort of just like put their list on this one place. And then you could just like browse newsletter jobs. It seems pretty useful actually. I wonder if the curators get a kickback or something. I mean, presumably the curators are the ones with the audience. Yeah. So, and you know, presumably whoever is aggregating talent would get, you know, some cut, if not the majority of the cut of any kind of placement fee. Right. So the companies would pay Packy if they hire a candidate through him putting their vacancy in his newsletter. And then, like, this platform would take some out of that. I'm guessing it's something like that. I'm, I'm not sure. But that, that, seems, uh, that seems rational. Let's, let's just make sure we're talking about public information. If we look online, if we search for Cardea, do you know what their website is? Not sure if they have one. Oh, okay. I see Cardea bio, but that's not them. <laughs> we can well, we can get more into it when they come to in ten minutes. Yeah. Um, I'm also curious to hear about you know how how they think about various channels. Like um, you know, I know we've been sort of studying the TikTok ecosystem lately, and like, is there a play for where? TikTok fits into this kind of world, or is it more like Slack communities, or you know, what are the various types of sources that might work? Yeah, you know, is it new, is it Substack newsletters, Slack communities? Do yeah. larger platforms have a play? Yeah. How did you see? I'm actually just just popped over to Twitter, and I noticed uh, Siki Chen. You know Siki? Are we talking about him? Yeah. He um he's talking about how he said the Runway Co. is the company he's working on gave Gather Town another go as our virtual office recently. We last tried it a year ago. It was interesting, but way too raw for us to stick with it. 
haven't seen adopt a tool this quickly and enthusiastically since Notion HQ and Slack HQ. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I remember trying this once. There are so many of these right now. Yeah, I wonder how, how they all play out because it's, you know, there's there's just like an infinite space of unique offerings to serve here. There's sort of that first gen. I think we even played with some of the first gen of like the downloadable client ones. Mm -hmm. And they felt they felt a little too heavy and too much like tools we already use. But this newer kind of, I think we played with an early version of Flowtown, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And that that felt new and fresh and people liked it, but we didn't end up sticking somehow, but it was also very raw when we tried it. So it might be worth, worth another try. Yeah. I like the concept a lot. Could be worth another try. Some of these. Yeah. Especially with just like the spatial for breakout rooms after what we do in stand up and open office. I think that'd be quite useful. Mm hmm. Have you been following along with the uh, Colossus project? Yeah. I noticed that they're talking about this concept of blocks, which they said in the months and years to come, we'll be building a huge curated database of content for you with tags, queries, badges, etc. We call these blocks. Hmm. And so here, I'll share the link I'm looking at right now. And so there's like, there's a block called Jesse Walden, a primer on NFTs and it's 48 minutes. And then Peter Chern and a solo success in Hollywood. That's a nine minute one. So it almost seems like, it seems like blocks are a flavor of this. I think we've seen, you know, various attempts at people like curating podcast content. Yeah. And this looks like kind of a new take on it, at least new to me. I haven't seen anybody do it quite this way where it looks like I'm not sure how they relate. I'm having a tough time <laughs> forming the relationship here in my head, but it does seem like there's something interesting here. So we're looking at a particular episode page. I just shared a link to Jacob's content to commerce, Jesse Jacobs, Mike Kern's content to commerce. That's a one hour episode where presumably um, Patrick O'Shaughnessy is interviewing Jesse Jacobs and Mike Kearns, but then there are blocks. It says, want to dive deeper, check out blocks, the best content to keep learning on any topic. So are these just community curated as relevant to the topics addressed in the high level podcast? Hmm feels like it's oh it's actually the whole episode it's also oh or links huh so just, blocks are just like like and links it, effectively yeah i guess maybe he's maybe he's kind of using the block term these are all links so it's not so much from the episode as things right. to, to look at after yeah, it says video, podcast, or article. So it's kind of like relevant links on the web. Yeah, which we've been seeing so much link sharing too. Like yeah. if you go to an older one, a primer on NFTs, it just says mentioned content. So instead of like blocks, it sort of has a list of content. Oh, like yeah. Links that were mentioned, and I guess that turned into what they're calling blocks. Mm hmm Yep. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you. 
I almost prefer just the text list more than mm-hmm. the box. <laughs> right. Yeah, the text list feels easier for me to know kind of what I'm getting. Yeah. Oh, I've heard good things about this. Have you heard of Mem? I saw a post about it today, but I didn't read it. Somebody, some people were talking about this kind of, they were making kind of oblique references to it. And I DM'd somebody, I was like, this sounds cool, what is it? And they mentioned it was Mem. This was, I don't know, a month ago or something. So it sounds like it's a little bit like, somewhere in the space of like Notion or Rome, but it's supposed to be much simpler, much more focused. Your mind on tap. As simple as Apple Notes powered by Collab Graph database. I'm trying to see how it works. Cause you have to sign up for like a wait list. I'm looking at this like, there's a few screenshots in the link I sent. Like, it looks a bit like Apple Notes, which I like. It's like feels very simple. I like the I like the simple like the start your note when you want to take it. Um, I feel like one of the tough things with Rome for me is it feels so journal like that it's like about this day, and to me it's it, it may just sound a little subtle, but the day paradigm doesn't fit necessarily. My stuff is more like topical, like oh I want to prep for this meeting or I want to you know take a bunch of notes about this topic, and I kind of have that at the time I'm clicking new and I, I'm sure, you know, there's some way to do that in Rome, but it, but the default interface kind of suggests that you're much more like day focused. Whereas I like the kind of, you know, Apple, I mean, these don't feel like these are the make it or break it details. I'm not sure. Yeah. And then I also think the collaboration, you know, the collaboration stuff is like the most exciting to me is like yeah. what, you know, if I think if the core use case is single player, then graduating to collaboration feels like it's not clear exactly when I should do that and how I should do it. Yeah. But starting collaboration for a personal note thing seems hard to build the habit. So it's like a little bit of a, a tricky balance to dance, you know, like a tightrope to walk. Yeah. For anybody who's building in this space. But I think, I mean, just a lot of opportunity to help, help people with, you know, personal knowledge management, collaborative knowledge publishing, and, you know, touches a little bit on some of the themes that we've talked about um, with respect to, uh, you know, like the Google Docs phenomenon. Yeah. Oh, I see. I also just got my Matter re-invite to Matter. Oh, nice. Which I've been waiting for for a while because I've liked, I met Ben a few times and always enjoyed chatting with him. Amit was really saying that he liked Matter a lot from Renko. Oh, cool. Capture passively your digital footprint and make use of that as though it was structured. The U API. Hmm. 
Hmm. It's pretty good how they, in matter, they use, um, they, they collect a wait list, then they DM people from the wait list with a loom walking through what it does. And they ask, would you like to join the beta? Yeah. <laughs> Which I kind of thought I already had, but maybe it's like a two-step join, like a recommitment to joining the beta. And it says, I'm messaging you because I see you follow a number of great writers like Tyler Cowen and Zeynep Tufeki. I didn't even know. I'm not sure. No, she's been writing a lot about like COVID stuff. Oh, okay. Popular Substack. Ah, uh, maybe that's maybe that's where I bumped into her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that looks right. Hmm. Yeah, it's kind of I I always like you know sort of you know, the, there's like these evolving habits for how, you know, kind of evolving approaches for how people like build your first interaction with a new service. Mm -hmm. That's kind of always evolving. Um, here, unfortunately I can't screen share, but I'll just text you the DM channel from matter. It's, really it feels fresh and really well executed it's you know very different than maybe a lot of you know the you know typical shuffle where you're kind of you know <laughs> okay sign up for the thing and then get the thing from some automated service they kind of have a little back and forth interactive thing it feels feels fresh yeah That's really cool. Like they heart back the thing. I assume that this is like a bot because they were picking out like, well, I don't know, maybe it's not. Because they were picking out like the specific people that I follow that presumably are already have newsletters that are on there. Yeah. I assume that's what that means. I'm going to watch the loom and I really wish we had screen sharing. Okay, I'm opening the loom. Hey, I'm Ben. I'm going to walk through Matter. So here, this is Matter. We're in the main. On its surface, might remind you of any number of They're recommended by public thinkers. These are scientists, scholars, through tens of thousands of tweets every day. Uh, tweeted um, because uh, created a dedicated place. Free. But what? Gorgeous this is cool. Reminds me a little bit of the like RSS for people concept we were talking about. Right, right. Oh, here's Kai. I'm going to invite Kai up. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's it's kind of RSS for people and that the people can publish anywhere, but it sort of aggregates them. So it also has some of this like about.me, you know, Beacons AI yeah. nature to it because it's kind of like a, you know, an aggregation hub of all the, the best stuff. Uh, targeted towards like writers in particular. Yeah. Hey, Kai. Hey, David. It's a pleasure to meet you. Hey, good to meet you too. Hey. Uh, hey, Mr. D. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, welcome. It's uh, by the way is uh, I don't know if, is Hot Art planning to come or I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know he he said he was in meetings for for a decent amount of time, but but he said he was free at this at this time. So okay. Um, I think that was his plan. No, right? Yeah. That's what we we don't have to we don't have to you know he can kind of join wherever he joins we don't have to necessarily wait. Um, so I think this is your first lunch break. So welcome. Yeah, it's <laughs> um, it's uh, it's great to be here. I don't know if you can tell all of what this is, but I'll give you a, a brief walkthrough just so you understand sort of what we're doing. Um, Mishti and I host this every day. It's a live web video show that we record and publish. So we are making a video right now, mm -hmm. but we're also doing it very casually, so we can we can talk about whatever we feel like. And you don't yeah. have to be scripted. And then when a great nugget or moment 
of content comes out, we'll make a highlight and then we can use that. And that's actually what you know would be most interesting to share and for people to see it's kind of gotcha. just those special moments versus like, you know, think of we're just hanging out on Zoom basically, right? Yeah, totally. Um, um, I like hanging out. So yeah. Yeah. So oh, just Hadar too. We can invite yeah, him. I noticed yeah, I've got Hadar is coming up right now. So he's gotta check his camera and uh, and audio and I'm setting Mishti to co host, which I didn't do before, but uh, at least you'll Hey Hadar. Hey. Uh oh, I think he's still he's muted. Right. Hutter, there you go. Yep. Yeah. We can hear you now. How's How you doing? Inside. Good. I'm just trying to join the, the video. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to remember, Hutter. Have, have you have you been up on the video with us before? So I've been on like a Zoom before, but this is my first okay. time seeing this new UI. This is awesome. Okay. Yeah. This is actually yeah. highlighter. You know, in browser video creation tool that we built. Um, so yeah, it, it, you've been on lots of Zooms, but this is, uh, it's a little bit different. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I like this a lot. This is awesome. Cool. cool you like. So yeah, the, so the main, I was just telling Kai, but the main thing is, uh, Misty and I record, we're making a video right now together and we just record a live web video every weekday for a couple hours and it's called lunch break. And the main point of lunch break is just to like, you know, sometimes we sit there and read Twitter. If you look in the discussion, you see some of the links we were reading and sharing with each other. So nice. we curate Twitter and read Twitter together. Uh, we bring interesting people on and we just ask a lot of questions. Sometimes it's like a investor or entrepreneur, or, you know, maybe a new company that's getting started. And we want like, so we like brainstorm and learn about those. Um, and so the context here, uh, I think is that Kai, I think you're starting, starting a new company, started a new company. You're kind of along yeah. the way. Yeah. So, so graduated from college in June and then I've been working on, uh, on this startup for since, since graduating and it's been a, it's been a fun ride. Cool. And I, I have a little bit of context on it, but I think it's in the, it's in a, you know, the a category that we have talked about actually a lot on previous lunch breaks yeah. kind of around oh. recruiting and curation of talent. And like these themes have come up again and again. Um, so I think we're like well primed with, you know, questions yeah. and thoughts on this, you know, meaning you don't have to convince us that this is an important space. We do believe that. Uh, awesome. But yeah, we'd love to sort of understand, you know, your story. How did you come to decide to focus on this and sort of what are you trying to solve right now? And what, what are sort of the, the main kind of, yeah, the arcs here? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think so. Um, the, the genesis probably starts from my, my natural inclination as, as a complainer. I think I like to complain about things when, when I get frustrated by them. Um, mm -hmm. and, and obviously going through college, one of those um, you know, experiences that everyone goes through is, is applying to jobs and internships. And I just remember being really frustrated by, by the experience um, and thinking that there was uh, something about it that, that was really off and, and something about it that, that could be improved, um, you know, across the sort of user experience, across the business experience, across a bunch of different things. And diving a bit into like the, the sort of rabbit hole of recruiting and how that type of stuff works, um, the, the modern day system is sort of dominated by a few like mega aggregators, right? Where you have like a LinkedIn or an Indeed um, that sort of aggregates 50 million plus job posts and then the user kind of searches through them and, and tries to sift through and find relevant results. Yep. And it's this sort of black boxing that I think creates a really bad experience on all ends of the, all sides of the market, right? Like it's, it's tough to surface relevant opportunities. If I'm looking for, I don't know, early stage startups with really high profile investors, like that's not something I can necessarily search for. Uh, and then conversely, there's no real targeting mechanism for, um, for businesses to reach out to candidates, right? And and I think it, recruiting is this sort of interesting sector in which almost kind of like a stock, you're sort of trying to read a bunch of signals and then project out some sort of future performance, right? And, and that sort of happens on both the candidate side and the company side. Yep. Um, and those signal amplification devices are have historically been sort of leaned on as ways to sort of um, find and, and recruit great talent, right? Like, you know, someone went to a great school or worked for a great company. Like, these are signal amplification devices. And... Um, as of right now, like the amount of, you know, I guess like people curators, talent curators are restricted um, to like either prior employers or big institutions. Um, and, and so as a result of that, I think what we've seen is like um, there are, you know, very few big players in the job space. Um, and most of the most of the sort of um, efforts to, to sort of improve the space have been around creating new aggregators. Right. Can we create LinkedIn for software engineers or can we create right, LinkedIn right. for remote marketers? Um, and in our opinion, at the very least, what underpins our thesis is that 
there's not really a, a single software aggregator that can effectively do this job, right? Like this is right. a very um, kind of socially driven, human driven yeah, yeah. Um, function. It's like a behavioral, that, almost like a human taste issue that's needed. And so I think yeah. this, I, I want to say like, let's, let's even back it up and broaden. I think the whole internet, it used to be, it, there were, it was very like in the late nineties, it was not enough content on the internet. Yeah. Now there's too much content, right? And so yeah. we've sort of gone through these phases of like not enough to like too much. And once you get to too much, then you need to curate it down. And I think yeah. in the job space, similarly, you have kind of like LinkedIn is like every company on the planet and then every potential candidate. And it's just like, good luck. How are they all going to meet? Right. And yeah. I think if I understand right, what, what you're building is you want to curate maybe both sides at least, or at least one side, but maybe both sides of that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the way that we like to sort of describe ourselves is um, as this sort of infrastructure layer for uh, like easy creation of new hiring markets, right? And mm -hmm. you, know, you t t take the total set of people building hiring products right now, and we think that's a lot smaller than what it should be, right? Like there's mm -hmm. um, a lot of different sort of pipelines and pools of people that could theoretically make a hiring product. Um, obviously, like the, the process of doing that right now involves either like bootstrapping a recruiting agency or making a whole website um, and running that whole growth funnel. But what, when you look at the sort of landscape, there's like all these like natural groups and pools that form around. And so um, what we want to build is, is again, right, like a place where it's really easy to spin up a hiring product, right? And, and it's really mm -hmm. easy to get distribution around that. And so like kind of the way we playfully dub it is like we're a platform of like Spotify playlists for jobs. Um, basically what this means is that there's just like a bunch of these sort of modular like playlists, like lists of jobs um, that, right. that generally focus around one thing. And um, the, the, the sort of key with how we built these lists was that they're really flexible on all aspects, right? There's sort of one central curator um, and then that curator can create permissioning around who sees that list in terms of talent and who could post to that list in terms of uh, companies. So mm -hmm. I think like, um, like our, our sort of long-term vision is saying like, hey, how can we get more and more people to make effectively make lists, right? Effectively plug into this sort of larger infrastructure and build hiring products for you know, their audience, their group, their community. Um, and, and that's where things sort of get a bit interesting to me in the sense that there's like a whole proliferation of like groups of professional people, right? Whether it's like a Slack right. channel or a Discord server, yeah. um, a listserv, or even like an open source project, right? Where there's a lot of these professional people that are congregating. And those are all, in my opinion, at the very least, like positive signals to employers, right? You're in this yeah. sort of invite only, you know, community for marketplace operators. Um, that's something that I think matters as much, if not more than maybe like where you went to school, right? And you sort of made it into this, this sort of uh, curated group of people. And so right. um, the way that we think about it broadly is like, hey, can we give them the tools to really easily spin up a hiring product, right? Which basically is just a series of job boards. And then can we build a distribution center for businesses to be able to reach all these groups without having to do this on an analog basis, right? Like it could be, you know, yeah. David King's 100 favorite engineers that you know personally, and you sort of invite them to this list and, and you plug into this sort of overall analytics pool. Um, and then a business right. is looking to hire engineers and they, they kind of go through us and we ping that job for relevant spots. So I, so I like this Spotify, you know, kind of playlist for talent idea that feels like a, a new, fresh way to look at this that I've never really kind of heard or thought about that framing. So I, I really like that. But I want to like get a little bit deeper on all of the incentive systems around like the communities that would be potentially like the aggregation hubs and the curation of talent. And then like, what are they expecting out of it? What are their requirements to do the work of playlist creation? And then what are the companies kind of, you've got this you know, companies that could be plugged in there. And I think there's some sort of like a company supply or demand hub, depending on how you look at it, let's call it demand hub, maybe. If yeah. you said. Um, but then are they also adding some taste? Like I will include this community or I won't include this one. Like is, does the playlist concept happen on both sides of the marketplace? Yeah. So I, I think like sort of uh, extrapolating, like let's say there's a hypothetical world in which the distribution is super seamless. So first focusing on the community incentive. Um, the idea there being that running that sort of BD function and, and making, you know, and getting enough sort of demand for posting jobs is, is quite a difficult thing, right? So let's say you plug in your community, there's six, 700 people in it. Um, they're all really great DevOps engineers. You plug that in and there's already this sort of pre-existing demand for those jobs that we could follow in, in the community direction. Um, it gives communities and, and creators a, a way to monetize. Um, and, and I think it doesn't include just community. It could be like boot camps, hypothetically, but it gives them a really easy way to monetize and provide value to their sort of group. Um, now, I guess sort of like, you know, going backwards in time a little bit on the company end, um, we offer like a sort of like 
lightweight analytics package on these different communities, right? You sort of say like, hey, this group of people, 20% um, of them have the title senior product manager and have worked at X startups before. 35% of them um, interact regularly with series A job posts that are made. And so mm -hmm. ideally what we're going to build on that business front is something that's much more um, automated as opposed to sort of like a, a la carte style thing where a business can just post a job to us um, and we understand which groups might be relevant fits for them. And I think um, it's a sort of, it's taking the analytical burden off of the, the platform, right? Like I think a lot of platforms try to do like, hey, which individual would be a good match for this job? Or which individual would like this job? And, and that's a very difficult task to get enough signals from a single person to really be able to build that sort of, um, kind of graph. Um, whereas by, by sort of channel optimizing, you're creating slightly more heuristic bets, but bets that are probably more likely to hit on, on average. So it sounds like from the company side, companies would come here, they'd make a post, roughly how they make a post today and other posting platforms. Um, but then it's up to, is it the is it the curator of, like, let's say I curate a Slack channel where, mm -hmm. you know, me and a hundred of my favorite people hang out that I think they're all smart and going to be, you know, effective. Then do I go here to write my playlist and and somehow expose it or plug it into a community so that only things that fit my taste part, like is it curation only on the kind of the community organizer side? Yeah, so, so let's say you have a Slack group, you sort of plug into our system, you get everyone to onboard there. Um, as the job posts come your way, the community sort of central curator has the option to accept or deny posts coming their way. Right. You could sort of say, hey, it's six hundred dollars to post to this group of people um, and it's you know, a thousand five hundred to make a featured post um, as a company sets their budget. You know, that would automatically be distributed to you and you'd have the option to say no to certain companies. Right. Which I think, um, while sort of counterintuitive to how these markets work, is actually something that's ultimately long term more powerful. Um, I think one of the things that a lot of startups struggle with recruiting is like, you know, maybe a recruiter DM someone on LinkedIn and you've never heard of the Series B startup before. And it's up to the talent to sort of make a snap judgment as, a, as whether that's like a good opportunity or not. Whereas if you're putting the sort of curation burden on some sort of central community leader, as long as they have trust in their group, by sort of accepting this job post into your, into your playlist, right, you're sort of effectively co-signing it. You're saying, hey, you know, this is a great place. I think you should look at this. Um, right. And we really... And then does a... Yeah, d does the community organizer, are they like what's their what's in their head are they saying this is how i'm going to monetize my community this is like my business or are they saying like this is like a service to the people that are in the community that otherwise like how how, how should we think about that yeah i think it's sort of um we like to we like to position ourselves as a product to them right like a feature if that makes sense um we're not trying to say uh you know upend your whole comm system or whatnot like we're a feature that you could use to, to sort of monetize um and provide value at the same time like jobs are one of those interesting um pieces of content out there in which the ad unit and the content unit are the same, right? Like, like when you're posting a job ad, that's the content that's being demanded by users. And so it's a really frictionless experience to monetize off of that because you're not actually taking away from the core experience. Um, so for us, it, it's really like a, like a feature in this community, right? So you have this community, but, you guys talk. Yeah, and you mentioned ads, because I think there's sort of at least two, you know, call it potentially obvious paths for how the tracking here works. And one is ad, which is kind of, pay to have the thing show up somewhere. And the other is some sort of like contingency conversion thing. And um, it sounds like a, a, a lot of language you're using seems to bias a little bit more towards the ad placement thing than the contingency. I wonder if like, are you exploring each of them or you've decided that this is the one you want or how, how, does, how do you think about that? Yeah, so I guess to provide context of that, like for now, the, the struggle with doing the contingency stuff is around attribution. And like, mm -hmm. do you have enough tracking to sort of attribute where the hires yep. are made? Um, what if someone's in two different communities and both those communities get shown the same job and they join who gets the payout? Um, so that's a problem that we'd ideally like to solve three or four years down the line, um, as opposed to right now. For right now, mm -hmm. the easiest sort of um, unit to, to, to deal with is just a placement. Um, I think second on the list would be sort of access to source, right? Where you say like, here's the membership directory. It's $4,000 to sort of reach out to them directly. Um, and right. then with that contingency being the final step in that line. Um, how, how, we, how do you think though, like placement guarantees of media, like let's say, you know, I think you mentioned $600 for a post. What if, what if like one community has their posts via a Slack and another has their posts via a Substack? Or they're like, oh, we'll post it in our job channel that nobody looks at. Like, is that still worth $600? So how do you actually standardize the unit and the exposure in a meaningful way? Yeah, well, I think that's where the, the actual like core UI that we built um, is quite helpful in the sense that there are a lot of these sort of hiring channels and sub stacks, um, but they kind of get lost underneath that. 
right? And so if you want to get access to the actual list itself, it, li it literally looks like a, like a listing of like a job board pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, you have to like opt into that, right? You sort of say like, hey, I'd like to receive you know, these job postings. I'd like to have them sent my way. Um, and it can get featured in the Slack group, but there is that central repository where um, a user can either go back and look at the you know, featured job posts from the past 10 newsletters that get posted. And that's posted via, like, uh, that's, they opt in and then it's sent from, from the Cardea platform to the, the end user via email? Is that? Um, yeah, yeah. So there is that, that list. They could visit a link, right? There's like a Cardea.work, let's say a Cardea.work slash community ABC. Um, there, it would be that sort of job board right there. Um, and, then, and then it also does email notifications as well. Um, I think as we sort of move forward, we'd like to integrate with more and more systems, right? Sort of meet people where they're at, right? So maybe you could get right. posted into the list and then it goes into the Slack bot or it goes into a newsletter post. Um, but for now, it's just sort of the central repo and then email alerts. Right, right. Got it. Yeah. Misty, I think you had a question. Oh yeah, well, I was just saying that it reminds me a lot of what organically happens on Renko, which is a community that Hadar and I are part of. And Hadar, I'm sure like, I'll, you get this a lot because I think a lot of people like are always asking you for intros and whatever. Um, what what are your reactions or like do you have any other ideas on top? Kind of judging from your own pain points with this process, helping other people. Yeah, I mean the the experience uh, through Renko's job board is exactly like is one of the many things that led me to be really excited about uh, what Kai's working on with Cardia. I think it's the the perfect sort of example, right? Where between uh, me and, and Jen and you know a lot of other folks in the community, we all have uh, people that we know who are hiring uh, startups, companies, and that's essentially the curation layer. We're all posting stuff into that channel. Um, this would really just be a layer on top that makes it much more easy to interact with. Like you could imagine like instead of uh, con context getting lost in the Slack channel over time, it could be better persisted. Um, and then also through the like, monetization channel, there's more of an incentive for, uh, for me, for Jen, for anyone uh, to, uh, to add stuff there, right? Like we talked the other day about like uh, how we're gonna pay for like the Slack subscription fee for Renko. Well, this is like one of many ways that that could get done. Mm -hmm. And do you think, is it primarily going to be that the um, that the community or kind of the, the distribution point for the jobs are, is this like a way to, I guess, either like augment an existing business, like uh, supplement like an existing recruiting process or kind of payment they might have? Or is it like something totally new that they're like maybe not doing, like maybe there's no monetization, it's just a community. Uh, you know, I think if you think about the Renaissance Collective case that Hodder's pointing out, I think that's the case there. So, uh, you know, how, how, how do you think about sort of the, I don't know if I'd say, you know, is this augmenting or is this starting something anew for people or how, how do they think about that? I think it really depends on the group that we're looking at, right? So someone like Anthony Pompliano has a job board that he launched, and I think he's making like $750,000 a year or something like that. Um, so in some cases, you have people that have built the job board. Um, I think it's a very like easy step function to be like, hey, I have this cool community. Why don't I help them do recruiting? Um, mm -hmm. For some communities, they haven't started it off yet, right? And some, they have maybe an Airtable with like Zapier integrations, and then others might have like entire job board SaaS. Um, where we sort of come in is sort of by saying like, hey, you know, not only do we provide a really easy to use like job board interface, there's also that idea of segmentation, right? So a community could hypoth hypothetically run three lists where one is public to the whole community, one is private to people that have eight plus years of experience, and one might be another list altogether where it's just for community members to post to one another. So there's that sort of idea of like increasing your revenue per transaction. Um, mm -hmm. And then probably more crucially is this sort of distribution engine, right? Where um, you know, most communities out there aren't run by someone famous like Anthony Papliano, right? Like they're, they're run by, you know, Oxford alumni in America. Um, mm -hmm. But these are still valuable t assets to the hiring manager's perspective. And so that's where that kind of distribution engine comes in, where we think we could unlock this sort of like long tail of professional communities, right? Where there's 85% you know, are probably not famous, um, but still have that very hireable um, group of people in. And so that's where we sort of say like, hey, let us help you on that distribution side of things. Um, right. But to answer your question, yeah, it probably depends on the community. Um, it depends on how far along they are on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like there's also interesting opportunities for, like, co-signing or person-to-person -person kind of amplification of, like, we have Renko, but there might be people who I'm like, wow, this person is, like, literally the best engineer I've ever met in my life. And then it's a high-quality pool, but then some people have, like, very special relationships with one another that surface 
even more additional information. So kind of yeah. like pulling all those signals into one seems pretty interesting. Yeah, it, it, it's basically like completely, right? So it, it's sort of like what we're like, sh we wanted to take the idea of like this job board or this like recruiting marketplace yeah. and say like, how can you really make it super grassroots and super social and, and sort of expand the total amount of people that are doing this. Um, and so yeah. like all that type of, all those features, right? Where, whether it's like, you know, kind of co-signing or posting to one another, um, it definitely on our roadmap. And I, I think it sort of extends even to like much more informal groups. Like, um, you know, a lot of people that have wanted to use it are uh, production managers at studios, like, like production studios, where they say, I have a lot of companies that I like to work with. I have a lot of contractors that I like to work with. Right now, I get an email from a company and I email it to all these contractors, um, right? If I could just have this sort of central list and invite them into there, uh, it's sort of putting that workflow in automatic. Yeah. And that's interesting. So I, when we talk about like new recruiting models and stuff, my head's always going to like tech and startups and stuff like that. But uh, you're talking about like these production, you know, production managers and kind of as I guess it's what call it like the Hollywood use case. So I wonder, do you, do you get a sense, is this going to be like more impactful and more important starting point actually outside of kind of the Silicon Valley style of recruiting? Like, are we just, am I in the wrong headspace thinking about things like LinkedIn and triple light and like kind of, you know, technical recruiting? No, no, I, I think I think we're definitely starting off in, in the Silicon Valley space. I think that's sort of where the, the, the community ecosystem is sort of most mature and robust. Um, and for us, it's really like, uh, you know, where has this behavior developed strongest and um, who would be most willing to adopt this? Um, I think I think in our minds, like the priority right now is getting as many people to do this as possible and, and almost um, making this behavior shift uh, obvious. And so in that sense, starting in tech is, is probably the, the, the best place to do that. Um, and it. it's sort of where we know the best as well. And I, like I, I imagine. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, I, I imagine that it's, uh, it's also more helpful in job markets where the talent is differentiated, right? Like uh, in a engineering mindset, like my the mm -hmm. engineer that I love the most is going to be a great fit for certain companies versus for, uh, you know, like you wouldn't use this to match like taxi drivers or people. They would use Lyft or Uber. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's sort of like the core thing that we believe is that very often, at least in, in this sort of like knowledge, like labor segment, um, there's actually like these hiring markets actually display like negative scale effects past a certain point, right? Where mm -hmm. you have 500 really high quality engineers. That's a great experience for the engineers. And it's a great experience for the companies as well. 10,000, still great. 100,000, 1 million, 10 million. By the time you get to a large enough size, you sort of lose the magic that existed in the first place. Um, and Right now, there's no really other option, right? It's either scale or die, or I guess you know, bootstrap something over the course of many years. Um, and so we hope to provide that that really nice like little middle ground where it could be done um, much more easily. Right. And it sounds like there's sort of the middle, let's call it like mid market is kind of where you play. Like if it's somebody who's already got a big enough audience, they might already be doing this on their own, and they kind of have a bunch of resources to get that done. And maybe if somebody's just starting out. They're, you know, they, it's not like appropriate to start kind of monetizing this way, but kind of this maybe the mid market is kind of what I'm hearing. Is that is that accurate? Well, I mean, you know, I, I can't really say anything all in terms of like early partners just yet because um, we're still waiting to launch that. But we have a lot mm -hmm. of the, the um, some really exciting big players that are going to do this as well. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from uh, the fact that these tools right now for these job boards aren't built for this use case, right? They're built for like, hey, we're going to provide job board SaaS for you to build your own recruiting company on top of. Um, and so uh, in that sense, uh, I, I think it goes across like from top down. Really, really our go-to-market strategy is actually to go after the big players first, because I think that, that helps sort of trickle down um, yeah. a lot. By big players, you mean big players and communities, like large yes. communities that have a lot of, okay, got it. Yeah, creators, communities, like like all, all, all those type of people. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think it's almost similar to like, you know, how Shopify, let's say, is like the go-to platform for even a like multi-billion dollar e-commerce company, because it's not worth their time to build out like the interface for their customer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. And then when you think about sort of the the places where, you know, I, I guess every kind of, I mean, effectively, it's kind of like a marketplace, right, in a sense. So every marketplace ends up having, you know, either, you know, supply constraint or demand constraint or, you know, some of each. And, it, it, you know, it's kind of balancing the two and growing them each at the right pace that they serve each other well and you don't cause too many people too much pain. Uh, so I wonder just sort of like where you are right now, do you feel like it's more constrained on one side or the other? Like what are the what are the biggest kind of challenges in figuring out how to serve people well? Yeah, so I definitely think um, it's it's most difficult to get enterprise contracts, especially as like a, a an eight-person startup. 
Um, right. That's sort of another reason that we're going after the sort of more well-known creators and community leaders first, because they effectively have both sides already there, right? They have the people, they have the companies that are sort of have this pre-existing demand. And so we can slide in quite easily as just like a, like a software tool, right? Hey, do this super easily. That'll be great. Um, yeah. After we get the big players, um, then I think it becomes a sort of flywheel of like, hey, we get a few more sort of um, maybe slightly slightly well-known players. Um, there's more businesses that are in our ecosystem as well. Um, but ultimately, I think I think like it, it's it's got to be like a like an incremental thing, right? We're sort of like going from like a like a flywheel of sorts, right? And by the time we have a bunch of businesses, then I think the sort of ultimate long-term goal would be you could just plug into this and start making money immediately, right? Where, where there's that that existing pool of supply already there. Right. And why haven't the large players? that kind of have both sides of it, why haven't they done this kind of thing? Have they sort of done this internally and, and there's some value they would get to working with a third party or how, how, do, you, how do they think about it? Um, when you say large players, do you mean like the large recruiting players or like the large sort of community players? Uh, I guess either, but I think you were mentioning that like large players, and I, I, I understood it more on the community side, but large players in the community side probably have a lot of the uh, audience or kind of community, the people demand, I don't know, talent supply side, let's call it. Yeah. And then um, they could go chase down interesting opportunities and probably do some sort of I don't know, premium sponsorships if they're working at like a large enough scale. So presumably like they kind of maybe at some scale already do some of this. And are, do they have like a special set of needs that you can uniquely solve here? Or are they just like they want to outsource the problem and just not not be involved with it and it's too much hassle for them? Or how do they think about it? Yeah, so I think like, you know, when we even when we talk about like large players in the community or creator space, like these are still like one or two people working on things at once. Um, right? mm -hmm. like even sort of the, the biggest newsletter writers have, have potentially like a team of three. Um, and so most of what they're doing right now is analog, right? Where a company will email them and say, hey, I'd love to sponsor a job post in your newsletter right now. Um, and, that, and that'll go back and forth on that front. Um, so, so I think on their end, really what we're solving is that sort of automation piece, right? Like, like how can we unlock... Um, you know, 10x the amount of jobs that come their way um, without actually having them spend more time. Um, and so you know, that, that, that's generally how we think about it. Um, and then also like on pricing, like I think we're, our pricing model is quite unique in the sense that um, we're not going to be charging any sort of upfront costs to these communities or these creators. Um, it's going to be a small fee of revenue if it's a job that they pull in themselves. And if it's a job that comes from our distribution engine, it'll be a larger percent of revenue. Um, right. So if, if a, you know, Google posts a job to us, and then we post it to 10 communities, we'll take a large cut of that. Um, but if it's just a community that exists and, and Google goes to them directly, we will we'll barely take any fee off of that. So um, right. it, it's sort of an alignment of pricing, um, product, uh, that, that idea of segmenting to increase that, and then also time constraints as well, um, which I think has sort of uniquely positioned us to, to, to have right. this one. And I, I, I think I tried to ask this before, but I don't know if I fully internalized the answer. But um, in, the, in the case you gave, you know, Google has these 10 communities that might go to, do they have control within the Cardia platform to say, you know what, I think only eight of these are really appropriate communities where we want our stuff to show. Is it is it curation from each side of it or is it more curation on the community side? Yeah, I, I think we'll have to offer that option um, on the enterprise side as well. Um, yeah. That's that's probably the part of our product that's the least built out right now. Um, I right. Think, like, philosophically, we understand, hey, if we have you know, 15,000 different groups, formal, informal, whatever, um, we can charge a lot of money for, for, for companies to get easy access to all of these. Um, the way that looks exactly, uh, we'll still have to figure out, but, but I think we will offer that sort of uh, flexibility on that end as well. Right. It reminds me a lot of, um, do, do you know the AdSense uh, kind of network? Is that, that the way like the a network works? mobile gaming so, ad network thing? Oh, no, just, just, um, just Google's, Google has a, an ad product that functions kind of like you're talking about, which is you know, Google built up a bunch of advertisers on one side because search was a really highly visited you know, website. And so that got a lot of advertisers lined up. And um, with that, then Google syndicated search out to other places where people were typing in queries online. So AOL being one of the early ones. And then, um, and then Google also had a product called AdSense, which... Um, places those same types of ads based on content targeted. So the, any given publisher, maybe you write a famous gaming blog, you can actually run AdSense ads along your gaming blog and it gets targeted based on the keywords that are relevant from the content on your blog. The, the point that I think is relevant here is that you have some publishers want to be able to control where, like which kinds of 
advertisers they will support. So they have a lot of fine grain control to turn those on and off. And then similarly, advertisers want fine grain control to turn off where their ads show. They might be like, oh, we'll take the bucket of them or we only want things that have certain audience demographics. So there's actually like the marketplace is strongest when it can um, let each side of it express any of their kind of configured preferences that they want to sort of make better matches, which let them bid higher because they're getting really the the content they want, you know, kind of the, the placement and the, the ad types that they want. So effectively, to me, it sounds almost like it's AdSense for for careers is maybe yeah, a way to, yeah. to think about it. I think that's, that's, that's I think, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so yeah, right, like giving that sort of flexibility. Um, and, and, and I think it, it sort of speaks to an issue generally in which, you know, I think what we're trying to do more broadly is sort of like increase the amount of pipelines that exist, right? Like how many mm -hmm. people can you get your job post in front of um, in an engaged form? And, and so, you know, that to me, that involves creating a lot more platform, but exactly like you're saying, yeah. Right, so it, it sounds to me like um, the hypothesis behind why this should exist is because there are all of these kind of niche, let's call it communities and, and newsletters and creators. And there's these like aggregation hubs that do exist. And, you know, I guess whenever I think about that, then I also think of the opposite is like, well, okay, are there new ways to use the fact that you're going to have this targeted, you know, demand to, you know, bootstrap new types of communities that might, or can you actually enable new things to form because now there's a monetization model where there wasn't before. And I don't know if that means go out to like existing large scale things, find a good curator and then help them both build audience and manage curation while you're the monetization model. So it's almost like a business in a box to some extent, like maybe I, I'm just totally making it up, but maybe you're into like fly fishing or something and you've got some advertisers, you know, career, you know, career opportunities that actually turn out to just love having fly fisher people, you know, placed in those. And so, uh, so could you actually help bootstrap a new type of community? Like, are there other opportunities or is that like an important category that's, to consider? That's, that's like 150% the, the sort of long-term goal, right? Like, um, there is this sort of central platform in which we, we do attract users and say like, Hey, explore all the different lists that exist here. Um, and by sort of having, I guess the three pieces, right, which is the monetization model, the sort of supply of job posts and the demand, um, we really want to do enable the creation of a lot of new recruiting businesses and a lot of people that are doing this um, that haven't done it before, right? It, it's kind of um, again, that, that sort of happy middle ground of, hey, I want to start a recruit because I want to help people get hired. Um, it's either right now, VC back it, scale, see if that works, or bootstrap it over five to 10 years. And on the longer term horizon, we do want to be that middle ground where um, th the thing that we always say internally is like on a 10 to 15 year horizon, every single hiring product that gets built should be built on top of us. And, and we should be thinking about it from that perspective. Um, these communities and these creators are a very interesting wedge into that because um, they already have the sort of existing demand and supply around that. So, so we just sort of fit the product to them. Um, right. But in our mind, they're, they're, a, they're a sort of demand wedge and a sort of uh, validation wedge as opposed to the end game goal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's Makes interesting. Because on the other extreme end of like the enterprises, it does seem, and this has come up before on lunch break too, with people saying that like we all know certain individuals who end up being such hubs for kind of like job transactions in a sense. It's it's difficult though because the highest quality intros often come from like really personal relationships where it can so it sometimes feel like awkward or like unclear how you would monetize that without skewing that relationship. Yeah. This came up in like a week or two ago um, when we were brainstorming about another recruiting related idea. But yeah. clearly there are those kind of people who are just natural connectors and they may or may not want to do this as an actual business because I think a lot of them are connectors because they've gained like a claim in some other realm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, and so I think the, the two things that we think about that are, are one, the, the sort of macro tailwind we have is that monetizing yourself has never been more acceptable than it is today, right? Like yeah. you can monetize anything of yourself and that's cool to do now. Um, and two, if people wanted to do it for free, hypothetically, right? And they didn't want to monetize that that's fine for us too, right? Like the amount of marketing yeah. that pulls in and the amount of eyeballs that pulls in is overall a, a net positive, right? Like as long as there are enough of these lists and enough of these groups and enough of these super connectors forming, the monetization will follow. And, and we have really no doubt about that. So um, what, one, of the, one of the sort of 
uh, strong demand points that we have right now is from angel operators who like have their portfolio. I was of, about to say exact same. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But they have their sort of portfolio and they meet really cool people throughout their, their sort of just general career. And you can just send this link out, right? You can just be like, Hey, come check it out. You know, I think you're great. Like any of these companies, any of these jobs. This, this by the way, email. is a huge pain point for me. I, I'm not even like that high scale as that angel yet. I have like 30 portfolio companies, but it's already a huge problem for me to connect t- t- talent to my companies. I'll be using Cardia as soon as I can for this exact use. Yeah, yeah I, I think this is a particularly interesting one too, because the fact, you know, there's, there's a lot of the best opportunities are effectively, you know, illegible today on the internet, right? Like the, the best things are either like, not defined or not published, or, you know, they go through private networks. And so, you know, Hotter's 30 portfolio companies probably have tons of jobs that they want filled, and maybe only half of them even have recs written for them. So it almost might be that the, that as an angel, when they reach out to you, what you do is you get these emails, right? And people are like, oh, hey, I've got these five roles that I'm trying to hire for. And maybe as an angel, you could actually take some of those and actually almost try to write custom things or see if they're okay being custom placements because I think if you can become the portal where these illegible, you know, not sorry, non-legible, I don't mean <laughs> uneligible, but not yet legible um, uh, roles get get surfaced, that's huge. That will draw everybody into your orbit because then more demand wants access to the stuff that's not the commodity. I mean, you know, Google, great company, but like, you know, there's plenty of plenty of ways to figure out what, what jobs are available there. It's like, you know, dozens, yeah. hundreds of places. Um, but you know, the, you know, portfolio company number 27 from Hutter, like, how do you figure out what they're working on? And they're probably interesting because they like tap, you know, they tickled something that made him curious enough about it. And so, you know, if you sort of trust his taste in, you know, in picking startups and, and investing, then it's a pretty good signal. So it feels like there's like, that's, that's a big opportunity. I haven't seen anybody really, really approach that. It feels, though it doesn't feel, co- it's not at the core necessarily of the proposition you're describing it feels a little ancillary is that should it be a little more kind of in the crosshairs or how how do you think about that yeah i i think it's interesting because it's still the same product ultimately right like like the the single product um has just like and any hiring it just has so many sort of use cases on that front with just it just you need permissioning on either end and you need some sort of curation sort of yes no in the center um and just with that alone and you know you can build like like layers like in terms of like recommendations or labels or whatnot but at its core, those are the two things that are needed. And so, um, like, angel operators are, are, are huge for us. Like, I think that's a, a segment that could probably even take off before um, professional communities or professional creators yep. because of how uh, simple it is. And, you know, we don't necessarily have the monetization figured out there yet, but it's also not important, right? It's sort of like, if, if Hotter's 30 portfolio companies are doing this and he's meeting talent and inviting them in, as those portfolio companies scale to A, to B, to C, they've been in our ecosystem since, since day one. Um, and, and that's something that, that we are particularly excited about. So it's, it's definitely like, um, one of our, one of our first targets, uh, to go after. Yeah. I mean, even on the supply side, I feel like you can, you know, you can go after the hotters of the world. You can also go after the venture capital firms themselves who want to provide, you know, more access and more visibility for their portfolio companies. Just like there's a ton of, a ton of stuff in that ecosystem that seems, seems promising. And, you know, obviously we're all kind of plugged in in various ways. So it seems like a, a healthy, natural starting point. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I think just to, like on um, one point that we, we like and I wanted to touch on is what happens by sort of aggregating these into one ecosystem is that you actually maintain incentives for high quality and, and actual curation efforts, right? Like if you think about right. a job board that's being indexed by Google or just living like anywhere, like the yep. incentive is to get as much content in there and to pick up as much on as many keywords as possible, right? If right. we have you know 15,000 of these sort of private lists, if, if the curator starts to do a bad job, there's competition on the platform. Like, like so, so that, that's something that I think um, can help us ensure that quality as, as we sort of move forward as well. Would you have requirements that the curator does or doesn't have the posts posted publicly? Like, meaning if something happens primarily on a private Slack, are there certain types of opportunities that may only want to be shared in private context? I mean, I, I think about opportunities I see over email that do have that characteristic to them versus others might be like, oh, we already have a, I don't know, a job board. And so all of these are available, but actually getting them in front of the right people curated in that way can be useful. So. Do you see much of that kind of private versus public like desire? Definitely. Um, I, I think um, there's 
that that's sort of privatizing on on the the sort of talent supply side or talent mm -hmm. <laughs> supply and demand is such a tricky sort of sure, thing yeah. in, this, in this particular <laughs> but, but making um, you know private access on on the talent side of things is something that people are also extremely excited about um, because it, it it sort of a helps kind of ensure that you're doing right by whoever is trusting you as a curation expert and then b there's actually also more interesting sort of monetization methods you can go on that front right like if it's sort of saying hey these are just 50 people but these 50 people can see this and nobody else can um that's i think when you know whenever we do start to maybe look at placement fees that's where some of those those like more high sort of uh yeah larger larger transactions start to take place right i wonder if some of the placement fee stuff i mean placement fee from google seems easy you can certainly get them to pay placement fee from like a two person in a garage startup seems like less likely it's, yeah. I don't know, you know, along the spectrum there, there's probably some different types of incentives and expectations and offerings. And like, maybe, I mean, I, I you know, I, I'd be curious if there's such a thing as a, uh, you know, a, you know, some sort of, whether it's like a, a cash placement fee or an equity placement fee or an equity placement fee subsidized by somebody who wants to buy more equity than is available in a previous round. Like, are there, are there like levers to play with on kind of some of that early stuff? Yeah, I mean, that's super interesting um, and something we hadn't even thought about yet. But it, it's sort of like, um, you know, you, you could probably do equity placement fees. You could even do something along the lines of like a, like non-dilutive financing, right? Like like us as the sort of central platform could be like, hey, you know, take this out and then and then pay it back slowly over time, which I think is, is kind of <coughs> a no-brainer on that front. Um, yeah. our, our sort of central challenge is like giving the flexibility to these curators to, to create the financing models and then making sure that it all sort of fits together in, in, in the puzzle. Right. It wouldn't be a proper um, lunch break if we didn't share at least one one tweet from Amjad Masad because I feel like we're always <laughs> we're always sharing those. And, and this, I happened to see one from him recently that looked very relevant to this kind of idea that we're touching on. So I'm gonna I'm gonna dig it up right now. Sorry, I was giving the the preamble as I thought I'd be scrolling to it, and I haven't found it. Yet. <laughs> um, I mean I was going to say, though, as you're finding that, like, there's so much other interesting stuff that then brings to mind, like, I don't know, um, we were just talking with someone about the idea of being like an early uh, champion for like another person, or another company, even, like ways to get recognition for being the first person to, to recognize that like, DK is this gem, and this like, hiring marketplace, and I'm the first one who like found him kind of whether that's by you know like giving him a little boost in the marketplace or like whatever it might be if someone's trying to like build cred as a recruiter they're probably like little prestige signals you can build in as well that that are kind of yeah. okay yeah. i know that we're actually over time for today because we were supposed to end at 145 we're already two minutes over time oh um this has been super fun i did share the amjad tweet uh check it out it's it's relevant but kind of takes us off on another tangent that we don't really have a chance to go toward at the moment uh, but this has been a delight to get to, to chat with you. Um, you know, we'll, we'll make some highlights. We've got probably some interesting stuff to, to follow up on. So, uh, let me just at that say thanks and, and call it a wrap and thanks Hader for, for making this all happen. Yeah, of course. This is super fun. Yeah. Cool. Thank, cool. Thanks so much right. guys. Um, we'll see you and, and thanks for having me. Okay. See ya. Okay.